Welcome to Discover Christian Church Online. Our mission is to love God, love people, and impact the world. I have to share a story. I've actually been waiting for multiple years to share this because I wasn't sure where it would fit. And this week I was like, oh, I think this will work. So uh, several years ago, um, one of my uh, kids was in uh, school, Dublin, Scioto. And uh, they were in their Algebra 2 class, and their teacher at the time would, like, four times a year have uh, parents come in and just talk about what they did for a living and stuff like that. So I was invited to come in, and... Uh, uh, I, this young lady came up and she said, so what's your name? And I told her and, and she said, well, is that your kid? And I was like, yeah. And she goes, oh, your kid's really nice. And I was like, oh, you know, you know, you got that parent thing. You're like, yeah, that's really cool. And then she asked me, she said, so what do you do? And I told her, and I'm not kidding. This is exactly what happened. She was like, huh? I can't be around you. I can't be around a holy man. You're a holy man. And she ran to the other side of the room and stood in the corner like terrified. I'm not joking. I was like, what in the world? And I mean, maybe if Jesus was there, you know, maybe. But I mean, I'm just Steve, right? So, um, but it made me think. I was like, wow. What in this lady's background or what in her experience caused her to react that way? Like to feel so unworthy, to feel so maybe broken, to feel so inadequate, to think I'm just not good enough to be around this person. We, we sort of understand it a little bit more like when the story of, of Jesus and Peter and they're doing the fishing thing and suddenly there's this miraculous amount of fish and Peter just, he breaks down. Because Jesus is the one who made this happen, and, and he, this is not possible for just an ordinary person. So Peter falls before Jesus, and he says, please depart from me. Be, just go away. I cannot tolerate being around you because you are holy. You're perfect, and I'm not. I am just not worthy. Now, we've all felt this sense of inadequacy at some point in our lives, haven't we? It might be athletically, like you thought you were pretty good at something and then you met the person who was awesome at it and you're like, ah. or academically, you're doing great and then you, ah, right, that one kid or that group of kids or musically, you compare yourself to somebody else and you're like, man. Or you look at body shape. I mean, this is a big deal for teens. It's a big deal for anyone. Body image, I just don't measure up. Or financial status, like, we can't afford that. Social media has made this obviously infinitely worse in our culture. And so much, as we know, of what you see on social media is not even real anyway, right? It's just this false narrative, if you will, this presentation that's not true. And even if it is true, it's so far exceptional, right, that it doesn't stand up as the norm anyway. But we judge ourselves by those things so often. And I think this can happen spiritually, too. Like when we gather sometimes, unless you're in a, a small group context or talking to somebody about life in general, like you could easily get the impression gathering as a body of believers like, man, everybody else is like so on with their relationship with God. Man, I stink at this. And it's because we can see our own hearts and we honestly can't see anyone else's, right? Right? And so when we, we think, yeah, I do fall short, then there's this weight that comes when we hear this memory verse for the month. It says, I am the Lord God who brought you up 
out of the land of Egypt to be your God. So you're like, God provides freedom from slavery, like spiritually. I get the analogy here. This is awesome. I mean, this is a literal thing that happened to the Israelites, but I can see how this applies to my life. This is cool. Then you read the last part of it. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. Ugh. I'm supposed to be holy, God says, because God is holy. I mean, it's very clear. God has that expectation of people. Be holy, for I am holy. Is that really possible? We're going to look at Luke chapter 18, starting in verse 9. And my ministry buddy, Jay Scott, um, gave me the idea of using this particular text with this particular topic. So thanks, Jay. But this idea of holiness can be approached in a variety of ways. Uh, there are two that Jesus lays out very clearly in this story. And so turn again to Luke chapter 18. And we're going to start in verse 9. It says, Then Jesus told this story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. You get the setup, right? These people that think, I'm holy, they're like holier than thou, right? I mean, I've I'm, I'm got this righteousness thing. I'm right with God. I'm living this perfectly. Woo, look at me. So Jesus tells this story. Not only, by the way, am I doing it right, you're doing it wrong, right? That's the other thing he says. They, he's, they scorned everybody else. So Jesus says, verse 10, two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other a despised tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I am not, like, uh, not a sinner like everyone else, for I don't cheat, I don't sin, and I don't commit adultery. I'm certainly not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give you a tenth of my income. But the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, Oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. And then Jesus continues, I tell you, this sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Two very unique approaches. There's the Pharisee who stands, it says, by himself. He stands alone. That's very intentional. Like he doesn't want to be around these people that he already declared were beneath him. These people are poo, right? I mean, he's just like, these people are spiritual scum. Not like me. And he stands by himself. I'm pretty sure, like, there was the, this tremendous amount of respect that was given to a Pharisee culturally. And we look back at it and we're like, oh, the Pharisees, they were all, you know, like, just like real hypocrites. But in their culture, they were very highly regarded. But I'll bet you inside, it wasn't that much fun to be around a guy like this, right? I mean, anybody love hanging around people that are like, I am so much better than you. Let me tell you how great I am and how stinky you are, right? Isn't that awesome? You just love to be around those people. So he's standing by himself, probably because neither group wants to be together. But as he stands, he, he, he gives this prayer in public. And... Pharisees would give their offerings so everybody could see and hear the way that they gave. And that's just the opposite of what Jesus taught us. But he stands before God on his own merits. Look at this. He says in two verses, let me go, I'm going to count these. I, thank you God, that I too, I don't three, I don't sin, and I don't commit adultery. I'm certainly not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week. Seven times in two sentences, he says, I, 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 look at me, look at me, look at me. He says, God, I thank you, I'm not like these other people. But guess what? He is, he is exactly 
like, quote, those other people. He just doesn't know it. He is so messed up, he doesn't even see how messed up he is. He's the definition of a hypocrite. He puts on a mask that goes along with his external appearance. He projects this perfect image, but it's not real. It's what's inside that God is looking at. It takes us to the second person, the tax collector, despised, as Jesus said, the enemy. He, he has said, yes, I'm going to be aligned with Rome, your oppressors, not with you. He is the opposite of the Pharisee in almost every way, even though we don't know much about him, but he stands before God. And he can't even lift his head. Like he's just so humbled, so feeling so, so broken. He confesses his sin. He says, God, I am not worthy. He begs for God's mercy. And Jesus tells us that only one of these two guys walk away justified, right with God. Only one of them walks away declared not guilty. And it's not the one everyone would have guessed it was going to be. Now, why is it that the tax collector is right with God and the Pharisee is not? Well, we're going to look at three pretty big theological words. You don't really hear these outside the church very often. These three words are related. One of them is holiness, which is the theme of the chapter this week. Another one is justification, and the other one is sanctification. But let's look at justification first. That's the word that Jesus used. Same word he said, he is justified. Well, what is justification? To be justified is, is like a legal definition. It means that God has declared someone to be innocent. God declares them to be holy, to be perfect, God forgives their sins because they have admitted that they need the Lord. And so God views them, God treats them as if they kept every rule, every part of the law that God gave the people through Moses. Treats them as if they had completed that perfectly. Now, in Acts chapter 13, verse 39, it says, You can't be made right with God. You can't be justified by keeping the law of Moses. It's not possible. Why? Because no one can keep the law of Moses. No one can do all of that. No one ever has except Jesus. And James tells us that if you break one part of the law, you're guilty of breaking the entire thing. So no one stands before God as righteous on their own, right? But by placing your faith in Jesus, declaring, as this tax collector did, that you need God's forgiveness... It changes things. The tax collector had not achieved moral perfection. He hadn't obeyed all the rules, but, but he instead asks for God's mercy. Knowing that he cannot stand before God on his own. And that's why Jesus declared him, and not the Pharisee, to be right with God. You see... He was justified before God, and justification happens immediately. It's an instant thing that happens when you place your faith in Jesus. You are justified. You are made right with God instantly. Now, another word is sanctification. Sanctification is the process of being made holy, and it results in a changed lifestyle. It's kind of, it's basically like becoming this thing that God has already declared you to be. Like, you are holy. You are justified. And sanctification is the process of getting there. It's a lifetime commitment of following Jesus in discipleship on a daily basis. I could be wrong on this, but I believe 
that holiness encompasses both of those ideas. So holiness includes the basic aspects of justification. You are being instantly declared holy by God when you say, I can't do this on my own. I need Jesus. And sanctification, holiness, happens as over time you follow Jesus in this lifetime of discipleship. You could say it this way. Holiness is both received and expressed. Now, what does that mean? Let's go back to this phrase. God says, be holy for I am holy. And I think this works. If you take the word for, you can, you can explain part of it this way. God says, be holy for I am holy. In other words, the cause of it, the reason for your holiness, for is me. God says, be holy for I am holy. I give my holiness to you. Here you go. It's like, I'm rich. Be rich for I am rich. And I give you my rich. You know, I give my rich, my riches, right? So now you're rich because for I am rich. I've given it to you. God is so holy that when he declares you to be holy, you are. And again, that's justification. I like what Mark Moore says in this chapter. He says, holiness happens when God proclaims, not when a person performs. It's good. Holiness is God's gift to us, not our gift to God. Again, that's really good. Holiness is received, not achieved. So be holy, for I am holy. I'm giving this to you. But the other part of it is true as well. God says, be holy, for I am holy. And here the word for is the motivation. God says, be holy, for I am holy. Would you be holy, motivated to be like me? And this holiness is expressed in our lives. If you look at Colossians chapter 3, starting in verse 1, it says, Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Jesus, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all of his glory. You have this new lifestyle, a life that is seen as as a blessing to God because it was a blessing from God. And you strive, you strive to live in a way that's holy, not to earn anything, but because God has given you everything. And this is sanctification. And so you see every part of your life as the possibility of being holy, right? Every part of your life is holy. It's a blessing from God. Holiness flows from our relationship with God internally and affects us externally in the way that we live. It's expressed in our lives. And that's how the the tax collector was living, broken before God. But humbly, it doesn't say, but I think we can understand he was probably kind to people compared to the Pharisee, right? He knew his own brokenness. He wasn't judgmental of others because he knew his own stuff. Whereas the Pharisee, externally everything's great, and I can see your junk, your junk. Holiness means that you are set apart. Holiness literally means to be set apart. Like that's the definition of the word, to be set apart. And it means then when we are set apart, we are not like others. We are not like the world around us. We're not like the things around us. God sets us apart. And I love the analogy. We actually stole it and used it a few months ago. I love the analogy that Mark Moore uses when he says, holiness is like a toothbrush. And you're like, 
what? <laughs> I remember when I read this when we first were going through this with our D group a few years ago. He says, a toothbrush, your toothbrush, the one you use to brush your teeth, is holy to you. You don't share your toothbrush with other people. It is your toothbrush. It is yours to use. And it wasn't holy because when you bought it at the store, it was inherently holy. Like you could use a toothbrush for anything, but you said this toothbrush here is used for my teeth. And it is holy to you. Now, what happens if you're cleaning the toilet and there's this one spot you can't get to? And you think, I need a toothbrush. So you take your toothbrush, you know, the one you've been using to brush your teeth. And you clean and it gets right to it. Cleans it right up. You use your toothbrush for this. Then you take your toothbrush and you rinse it out in the sink. I mean, you do use hot water, right? Or maybe you boil it, you know, get some boiling water and you dip it in there. I want you to raise your hand. How many of you, having done that with the toothbrush that you use to brush your teeth, how many of you would then, after cleaning the toilet with it, use it again to brush your teeth? Be honest. Listen, God sets us apart. He says, you are holy. So we don't want to be engaged in things that are outside of that purpose for which God has established us, for that reason that God said you are holy. Because when we do unholy things, it doesn't mean you can't be forgiven. We need to rest in that though, right? We need to think about that. Like, you're holy to God. I'm holy to God. So, so let's not live in a way, no one is perfect, but let's not live in a way that consistently lives outside of that holiness that God wants and expects and dreams for us to have in our lives. Instead, let's live out this holiness Every day, inspired by the Holy Spirit and changed by the Word of God. I love what A.W. Tozer said about this topic. He said, the stiff and wooden quality about our spiritual lives is a result of our lack of holy desire. Complacency is a deadly foe of all spiritual growth. Acute desire must be present or there will be no manifestation of Jesus to his people. It's powerful. So when we think about this idea of holiness, God is holy. The Bible says God is holy, holy, holy. God is set apart, set apart, set apart. There is no one like God. And God says, be holy for I am holy. How do we do this? How do we approach this? Well, one is to endlessly strive with everything you are to the best of your ability to live up to God's perfect standard. To do this on your own. And when we do that, it inevitably leads to failure. The other option is to be made perfect because of God's holiness. And again, this happens instantly, and it happens over time as we follow Jesus, and we are transformed by the Holy Spirit and the Word of God and being in community with each other. And in that situation, we can find victory. One more analogy. I don't know how you would quantify this, but the world's greatest mechanic is in the room. I mean, the greatest mechanic that has ever existed par excellence. No one better than this guy or this girl. Best mechanic ever. You are going to be an apprentice to this mechanic. 
the mechanic could say to you, you had better be as good as I am at this. I expect you to be perfect like I am. And all the pressure is on you as the learner, as the apprentice. Same mechanic could say this. Listen, I'm going to take the responsibility to guide you, to teach you, to train you, to prepare you, to equip you, and I will help you along the way anytime that you need it. Which one do you want to be an apprentice to? The burden in the second situation is on the leader, on the teacher, on the master, as well as the student. And this is the way that God loves us. This is the way that God apprentices us. This is the way God disciples us. This is the way God calls us to be holy for he is holy. And so in response to that kind of incredible love and truth from our God, two things. First, as Tozer said, we don't want to be complacent. So identify an area of spiritual complacency in your life. It might have just popped into your head instantly. If you're having a really hard time you might just ask someone around you. They probably would be able to tell you and then say, okay, thank you. Don't be all defensive. So identify an area of, of spiritual complacency. And second, have the desire, the holy desire, to be changed by the Holy Spirit and by the Word of God. And really, it would be great if you would tell somebody what that is, somebody in your life group or your discipleship group, somebody you trust with that to say, man, I will walk with you in this. I'm excited for you. Because when we place ourselves where God can do the work, transformation happens. And we use this verse all the time, but it's so important. Jesus says this in John chapter 15, starting in verse 5. Yes, I am the vine, Jesus speaking. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. Change is coming. You're going to produce fruit for Jesus. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So our job is to stay connected to Jesus and to allow the Holy Spirit and the Word of God to produce fruit in us and to transform us.